hundred one. And it was sponsored by Statoil. During her time at Imperial as the secretary for the AAPG student chapter, Zoe is presently in her third year at the of her PhD at the University of Manchester in the UK, funded by NERC, the National Environmental Research Council, CDT, Center of Doctoral Training in Oil and Gas, and affiliated with LOB3, an industry consortium. Her PhD combines numerical and physical modeling with outcrop and subsurface analogs, it's pretty cool stuff, to better understand deep marine stratigraphy and sedimentology adjacent to growing salt structures. This work was awarded Best Student Poster at the AAPG ACE in 2018 and has received two AAPG grants and aid. Zoe's recently served as Vice President on the AAPG Student Chapter at Manchester. Outside of her PhD, Zoe is a keen science communicator and loves teaching everything from geology to aerial gymnastics. So hopefully she'll be able to communicate her science today on salty deep water systems and multidisciplinary investigation. And with that, I hand it off to you, Zoe. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tim. Um, so let's just check. I'm hoping this is all going to work smoothly. Uh, so, organizers, can you see my screen at the moment? Yes. Perfect. Okay. And you can still see it? Perfect. Okay, let's kick off. So thank you very, 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 very much um, for such an amazing introduction and also for the complete honour of um, asking me to be the first speaker for this series because, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I'll just move that over there so you can't see it. So it's a privilege uh, to see there's like 130 people on on the participants list um, and I'm completely honoured to get this presentation, uh, get this party started. So what I'm going to present to you on today uh, is some of my PhD work on salt influenced deep marine systems. Um, and, but before that, I've been asked by the panel to give a little bit of an introduction to salt in general and to specifically to salt and stratigraphy um, because we want to make sure that the salt world is open to everybody. Um, obviously, this isn't just my work, this is a combination of uh, a variety of other col uh, collaborators and co authors, of which I wish to acknowledge them all. Uh, I believe that science is much better when we uh, join, join forces. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of uh, company, uh, companies and consortiums involved uh, that I'd like to thank, especially my funders, uh, NERC. So, um, that's a picture of me, but you can all see me. For some reason, I was thinking maybe you couldn't. Uh, I made the mistake of Googling myself while preparing this presentation. So these are the other, um, oh, why are they not coming up? Come on, there we go. These are the other um, images. Um, that come up when you Google me. So as the, they've already mentioned, I'm a keen science communicator, but also the slightly odd thing that I do is aerial gymnastics. Um, and so not just a crazy salt lady. Um, so a little bit of background to myself. Um, everyone's already covered this really. Tim's already given an introduction, but I did. I was at Leeds, uh, then I was at Imperial doing my masters, and I'm now doing a PhD at Manchester, uh, sponsored by the NERC CDT in Oil and Gas, which is a UK government uh, initiative to promote uh, geology training in oil and gas, kind of the revitalization of the North Sea specifically, uh, and to train the next generation of petroleum and broadly energy geologists. Um, I've, I've seen people present their, with, uh, present their careers with a, kind of an oil price um, overlay, but I'm actually gonna present it with a kind of my love or hate for salt as I, go through my life. Um, so top is yay and bottom is nay. So a few little points, uh, I guess when I was a kid, I really liked putting salt on just about everything. Uh, then I went through one of these teenage girl body as a temple phase where salt was the worst thing in the world. Uh, when I started my A-levels, I started to, I did geology for an A-level and then went on to study at a degree level and I was starting to think, oh, salt's actually a rock. It's not just something I put on my chips. Uh, and then went on to Imperial, realizing that salt has this in, in, a huge uh, importance in controlling hydrocarbons. That's where I met this incredible man, Chris Jackson, which then convinced me to think that salt was actually fascinating and I wanted to study the PhD in it. And throughout my PhD, there's been a very, what even is this kind of mode? Um, and then this psychic kind of imposter syndrome of I know less than Jon Snow for you Game of Thrones fans, 
versus I'm a salt queen. Uh, that's been made a lot, a lot better by the accompaniment of some of the my fellow salt queens, uh, Rochelle and Clara, who are part of the, the panel today, uh, Leo, who is missing in action, flying back from Brazil, uh, and Ross, who is a salt hero himself, but also a big, a big supporter. Um, so the outline of this actual presentation, that's enough of me talking about me, is that we will have part of the presentation to kind of introduce a little bit of salt and a little bit of salt and stratigraphy for future salt Saturdayers. So for those of you who've seen us on Twitter, you'll know that we are keen promoters of salt as a concept uh, and sharing each other's research. So I just wanted to kind of promote um, a little bit of things that are going on in the salt and stratigraphy world. Uh, before presenting some of the key findings from my PhD, which I describe there as being a jack of all trades, master of none style of research, because we integrate a lot of different types of data um, to try and better understand at a variety of different scales what is going on in the salt sediment uh, interface. Uh, much of the introduction, if you are new to salt, and I uh, know that some of you on this call are, uh, much of the introduction material can be found in what I would describe as the Bible for salt tectonics, uh, Jackson and Hudak uh, book. So here's some pre um, amazing images of salt, um, and let's get started with an outline about salt basins. So first off, salt is everywhere, uh, globally and across through the geological, geological time, and also in a variety of different basins across the world, basin types. Um, so it controls the distribution of some of our, the most important hydrocarbon and other energy resources globally, uh, including some of the most hydrocarbon prosperous, such as the Gulf of Mexico and Santos Basin in Brazil. So this is why we care about salt, why we want to study salt, because it's everywhere, no matter where we are in the world, uh, and no matter what type of geology, we're looking, what age of geology or stratigraphy we're looking at. Um, so salt, first off, is a sedimentary rock. So we've got a picture here of salt forming uh, in a, in a man-made uh, kind of salt pool um, on a beach in Malta. Um, so this is where, what we're seeing here is where the seawater um, can actually get trapped in these small, very, very small here basins. Uh, then the weather is hot, so it's actually arid, so we can evaporate more than we're getting influx in. And this is a very small scale for what we see in our kilometer scale uh, global salt basins, but it helps kind of communicate what the, what's going on. Um, ideally, we can see this precipitation of a variety of, site of minerals, but we all know that nothing in geology is quite as ideal as we'd like. Um, so like I was saying, this is where we have, we have a salt layer. It's deposited in an arid, restricted environment where evaporation exceeds water inflow. And while I've just got that picture there showing centimeters maybe of salt that's then uh, mined to put on our chips, this can actually form kilometer thick salt deposits. Uh, an example of which, uh, close to home for me, is uh, the Zechstein across the um, Permian Basin. And the key thing that I wanted to show with this map here, while it shows the Zechstein covers a huge area during the Permian, it also shows that it is indeed a sedimentary rock. So it's got fasces variabilities. We're not looking at something that's purely halite. There's a lot of variability. We can see gypsum, we can see anhydrite, and we can transition into carbonate deposits and also siliciclastic deposits. Salt itself uh, has some properties which enable it to make uh, the structures that we see on the seafloor. So it's very, very weak. Um, so both under extension and compression, we see so 50 or minus 50 would be super strong here. And you can see that salt falls down the middle. So it's particularly weak. It's also viscous. Um, so when I science communicate, I talk about kind of toothpaste and honey, but you can see that it's viscous, which means that over geological time, it can flow. Uh, it's low density. So once it's been buried within beneath about 900 meters of um, siliciclastic or carbonate material, it's actually lower density than the siliciclastics and the, and the carbonates, which means that it can rise buoyantly. Um, while our siliciclastics or our carbonates compress with depth, salt remains uh, incompressible. And salt is also particularly high velocity on the seismic, um, which is why it often uh, requires some velocity correction and why it often appears blurry. So these, these are the weakness, the vis viscosity and the low density of salt combine to make a variety of salt structures. 
um, on the seafloor. So because it's low density, it can flow over geological climb, we see all of these different geological salt structures. And they vary in 3D geometry. They also vary uh, depending on tectonic regimes, so whether they're deposited in compression or extension or, or on a passive margin setting. Um, and they can vary through time, they can be reactivated, they can be remobilized. The important thing here is that where we started, once started with salt, we can end up with a variety of different structures. And these structures can influence the seabed if we're in a deep marine setting, or they can influ influence the surface if we're in a shallow marine setting or if we're in an, a fluvial setting. So because I'm on this kind of borderline between, a, between salt and stratigraphy, we're now going to add some sediment to, uh, to our salt structures. So these are the basic salt structures we see, and now we're just going to go into a flume tank, and we're going to look at a sediment gravity flow and how then we'll look at how that responds to those salt structures. So we're in a flume tank in Utrecht, um, where essentially it's a swimming pool full of sand, um, and we're going to inject a sand uh, deposit in that is scaled to be a sediment gravity flow. So just to introduce what sediment gravity flows are, they're, um, they're sediment laden water that moves sediment from the shelf to the basin floor through geological time. They initially deposit under highly concentrated, highly, um, highly um, turbulent conditions with, and would deposit what we call a high density turbidite with stacked thick sands. And then as they radiate outwards, they deposit, they lose, um, lose their density, lose their concentration and deposit lower density sands. So thin bedded turbidites at the edge of what we call a lobe. So these are gravity flows typically deposit our channel to lobe um, morphologies that you may have seen in the deep marine. So where we were talking before, we had all those amazing salt structures. If we add a variety of different gravity flows to them, whether that's a mass transport deposit from failure or one of those turbidites that I've just shown you, we can see that that seabed relief generated by the salt can actually control the sediment dispersal pathways of our deep marine system. And much of this is also true for different types of depositional system. So you can see here that the channel, um, as we can see this channel is, um, has been deflected around that salt cord structure. Here we've got a channel that's confined between two salt structures and at the edge of this basin here, this lobe can't possibly get any further in because there's a big salt uh, structure controlling the topography there. Um, I just wanted to demonstrate next how, what that actually does to the stratigraphy. Um, so here's a discrete element model that we've been working on at Manchester. All of the black um, elements represent the salt and the different colors shown at the moment represent um, the sort of the sedimentary overburden that we've allowed to create some seabed topography. And next off, we're just gonna add some, um, some sediment to represent stratigraphy. Um, so you can see here, the layers are starting to deform on top of the, as the salt is growing. So um, initially, I'll play that again. Oops. Sorry, I will play that again. Um, so you can see initially there's a gray layer is isolated to either side of the structure. And as we're depositing these further layers, they're beginning to th they thin over the crest of the structure. Um, but further afield from the salt, they basically can't tell that there's stratigraphy there. So this zone over where we've got all this kind of deformation, we've got isolation, we've got thinning, we've even got structures such, uh, faulting starting to form through here. This is our halokinetically deformed zone. So it is influenced by salt and the stratigraphy is influenced by salt. Whereas when we're over here in this undeformed zone, this is more what we would call allocyclically controlled. So it's controlled by the deep marine system and it doesn't really know or care that there's salt nearby. So the concepts of salt and stratigraphy have been really, really well understood um, for some people that I know are on the call. I'm very honored that you're on the call. Um, we, can, we can look at how our salt structures, what we're calling diapirs here, vary um, in their, their growth rate varies with the sedimentation rate and can cause a variety of different geometries. These are some you may have looked at kind of um, during your education, if you looked at the variability of these structures. But when we go forward, um, they've been further developed on a, strata, on a kind of seismic scale stratigraphic level um, to be what we call, when we term, halokinetic sequences, of which there are two end members, hook and wedge. 
hooks typically form where our uh, diaper or our salt structure can rise quicker than our sedimentation rate, which causes these upturns adjacent to the salt structure. Whereas um, wedges form where we have greater sedimentation rate and rise rate, um, and these form or this kind of onlap geometry that eventually does bear, bury the salt. And you can see there that there's variabilities in their fasces um, dependent on the distance away from the diaper. But typically, after about a kilometre, there's no, you're no longer in what we would term the halokinetic sequence. And these structures can stack on top of each other to um, form what compos composite halokinetic sequences, um, which are associated uh, and are something maybe that you would be more, more easy to resolve on seismic. Um, in subsurface data and field data to better understand these different depositional systems has been done for other de um, many other depositional uh, environments, such as um, fluvial dry land um, in the U.S. in uh, Utah, uh, as well as mixed kind of shellful um, systems in uh, the Adelaide Rift in um, Australia. However, much of our understanding of deep marine halokinetic sequences still stems from um, our seismic understanding and our subsurface understanding. And then we insert into these kind of reservoir and depositional models, we're inserting examples from uh, the Karoo Basin in South Africa, which is probably the most worked deep marine basin in the world. Uh, and it's where much of our understanding comes from. But this is essentially a completely flat football pitch, which hasn't been influenced by any kind of topography. So the lobes can run out for kilometers. Whereas in our deep marine systems, which have been influenced by salt, it's more like a football pitch that's had lots of mole hills on it. So there's lots of little structures for the deep marine systems to move around. So we want to try and find a better analog um, for deep marine systems and also to better integrate the understanding. So because we're looking at some um, subsurface some analogs, I just wanted to introduce you their geological um, location. So our subsurface data is from the eastern central graben of the UK North Sea. Um, so the UK North Sea is a failed tripartite rift. Um, the pink, which is shown here, we've got uh, the blue Jurassic sim rift. So you can see that overall, the structure is controlled by these rift, the rift structure. Um, but the, the pink outline, is the outline of the Zechstein group, so the salt in this area, which I showed you on that larger map earlier. Um, and if we zoom into this area around the Pierce field, we can actually see that as well as having that broad structuration, the, um, the, the controlled by the faults, we've also got these kind of pinballs of pink. And those pinballs of pink are our salt structures that provide further confinement to our, for, our depositional uh, systems. Uh, and at this point, we're looking at the Paleocene uh, 40s formation in Pierce. So I'll introduce kind of Pierce as the problem that we're trying to understand a little bit more. So Pierce is a twin diaper related field. So there's two salt structures that are connected to depth in a saddle zone. Uh, it reservoirs in Paleocene 40 sandstone and it was discovered in 1975, but it wasn't actually produ first produced oil until 1999. So that 25 year of development is genuinely due to the complexities that are associated in imaging and producing and developing in these salt basins. And the, one of the only areas you can see in the world, um, they're in the Basque Canterbury Basin, where we've got salt structures that are shown in pink. So they're Triassic in age, so the Kuiper group of Northwest Europe. And they're flanked by a variety of different greens, which are our Cretaceous thin kinematic material. Now the Bay of Biscay broke up in the mid Cretaceous due to the rotation of Iberia and the general opening of the North Atlantic. So that's what's formed the Basque Canterbury Basin. Um, but it's actually been um, inverted to the surface by the Pyrenean orogeny, which has allowed us to study the Vacchio diaper in a lot of detail. Um, so this is my uh, field, field uh, analog that we use here. So here's a just kind of zoomed in map of uh, Vacchio. Um, and we're just gonna highlight the structure itself. Um, bring it up here. So this is the Bacchio diaper. Um, it's a gypsum and hydrite and carbonate and clay um, structure. So it's more typical of what we would refer to as cap rock rather than being a diaper itself now. Uh, it's thought to have grown reactively due to the regional extension um, during the, due to the relate, breakup of the Bay of Biscay, 
but then has grown passively um, due to loading from the north. So there's an uplifting plateau to the north, which has given uh, off a huge amount of sediment that has caused diapirids to uh, passively load. Um, and we're now going to take a drone uh, flight through Bacchio's halokinetic sequence. So those blank, those models from uh, Giles and Rowan that I was showing you originally, we're now just going to take a small tour through them. So we're starting off further away from the diapir and we're going to get closer. So initially you can see the beds are dipping, but as we approach the diapir, they're dipping much, de uh, much steeper. We can see some halokinetic unconformities there where the bedding dip changes and some carbonate structures, um, some carbonate that appears to have fallen off the flanks of the diapir um, and fallen there, you can see the white blocks. And as we get round here, we can see uh, the salt is, uh, sorry, we can see the stratigraphy is getting much steeper um, and starting to become overturned. So there's a hotel for scale there. Um, and the stratigraphy now is overturned. So in much in agreement with those models that we uh, showed originally. Uh, so here is the, the beach and the beach is actually mapped uh, as uh, based on its geomorphological low as part of the salt structure. Um, and the Caprock image of the diaper that I showed you is just a little bit further around the bay. We actually ran out of drone battery to get the uh, image there. Um, so here is um, an interpretation of what we've just flown through. So as we get closer to the diaper, our stratigraphy gets um, much steeper and towards overturned. As we get further away from the diaper, the, salt st the uh, stratigraphy youngs and becomes slightly less deformed and less influenced by the salt. Um, and we can start to see from the stratigraphic architecture here, we can see the individual packages thin as they approach the diapir. And also you can see individual deposits, so individual gravity flows or individual beds also thin as we approach the diapir. Um, and we've got here, um, and we're returning to the map. So not only have we got the Bacchio structure, but we've also got a, um, another structure at Guernica, which is now weathered away. Um, and with some very, very vintage seismic, um, it appears that they are connected at depth, um, or at least have been, um, just, which allows us to kind of study two different styles of mini basin. So mini basins that have formed between two salt structures, which we're calling confined, um, versus a mini basin that's formed where we've just got one salt structure. Um, and this is basically so we can compare, can compare stratigraphy of the same age but we can see how it's influenced by whether it's between two salt structures or whether it's just adjacent to one and how that varies. Um, the area is beautiful and I'm very sad to be confined to the UK and not able to visit the beautiful, beautiful Basque country. So these are some of the amazing outcrops that um, I'm very, very lucky to work with. Um, and they give us a huge amount of data. So here's um, a stratigraphic log that's pretty much semi-continuous semi through 500 meters of stratigraphy where we're able to really understand what's happening to that deep marine system. Um, as well as this, um, we are also able to test, so they were all my kind of analog, let me just pop back here. So these two analogs, our subsurface analog and our uh, field analog provide a specific, um, di they're, they're specific unique conditions. So they re represent a specific rise rate and a specific sedimentation rate. And while they may vary through time, they're very, very specific. So how they're gonna, re they're, they're all unique analogs. However, in order to test multiple different scenarios, we've tried to, um, so that we can quickly test different ideas and what would actually happen if we had more sedimentation here? What would happen if we had a different angle of salt structure here? We've, start, we've done some modeling. So um, the, one, one of the ways we've done this is through a discrete element model. Um, and the, the aim of our numerical model is to test how, how our stratigraphic architectures vary um, with sedimentation rate. And whether as you increase sedimentation rate or decrease sedimentation rate or vary sedimentation rate, whether you actually see um, a difference in how much of that sediment is deformed and what type of architectures and onlaps you receive. We've also run some physical models um, and these are in the flume tank in Utrecht. And these are to see how our topography um, depending on what orientation the topography is at, how that varies the depositional flow processes that are operating. Um, and I'll just introduce you to the methodologies of both of those models, and then we'll get on to some of the key findings of the research. So our discrete element model um, took some of the existing work from Emma Finch that has recently been adapted by Emma and Leo 
um, to work on salt structures. Um, we combined that code with subsurface analogs and the outcropping analogs and Emma's amazing uh, assistance to build um, a, a discrete element model um, that's able, so it starts off as a structure that's based on the geometries from uh, the Pierce field with our pre-kinematic over the top. We allow that structure to grow through geological time, so 2.2 two million years, which is about 40 minutes to generate some kind of structure um, and give some subsidence. So it's growing at the rate of North and South Pierce. Uh, it forms over, um, an overburden anticline, which then controls the, where the sediment is being deposited, much as it would do in the sea, in, on the seabed. Um, and then we've, we're able, through the remainder of the model, we're able to add sediment at different stages and at different sedimentation rates. Um, so throughout time, that looks something like this. So we have some sediment added, we have some more growth, some more sediment, and then we can study the deformation that's associated with that. We can quantify thinning rates, we can quantify structures, et cetera. Our physical models, they were in the flume tank in Utrecht. The flume tank is set up to, uh, to scale of a deep marine system. So it's got a shell, a slope, and a basin floor. We built a channel. Um, and then we input the flow. So we, our flow contains sand, silt, and a variety of different materials to mimic high and low density particles. Uh, this is what our, a laser scan of the tank looks like beforehand. So you can see uh, this channel up here, and then we're gonna come, here's the break of slope onto here. And we tried to test this with a variety of different um, stru um, structural confinements. So to start off with, we had no, no topography in the basin, then something that was maybe typical of a salt wall, or it could also be a rift, for example, um, that we lined up uh, in different orientations. So we had lateral, oblique, and frontal confinement. Uh, we built that structure out of sand. Uh, so this is an example from the tank of a photo that we've taken in the, um, in the flume tank of the frontal experiment. And then we were able to measure the flow velocities using these probes to see how our depositional processes were actually reacting to the salt structures, or well, the topographic structures. Okay, and now I'm gonna to present to you the key learnings. So the key learnings from this uh, work, um, there's a lot of them, um, obviously, uh, because there's a huge multi-scalar project and a lot of them are still going on, um, but I'm gonna cover six. So hold tight um, for this. So the first um, learning that we have is that small scale evidence for topography is really important, especially in the absence of topography, i.e. that the salt has welded out or been weathered away. So pieces of information that we gained in the field that gives evidence for salt structures uh, existing are injectites, which form where the sediment is overpressured and the sand can uh, force its way through the mud. Hybrid beds, um, and these are typical bed, beds that initially uh, formed in turbulent conditions. And then their flow has actually on, undergone transformation, so flow transformation, because of its presence to, and close proximity to a salt structure. So it's turned into a laminar flow, something more typical of a debrite. We see these kind of interface, turbidite, debrite, turbidite, debrite. We've also got load and flame structures and ripple reversals or reflections. And these ripple reversals and reflections are where we would have flow going in one direction and then bouncing in the, uh, the flow hits the topography and bounces back in the other direction. Uh, we also see similar things in the co in core. So this is the now photos from the core around the pierce fields. So again, we've got injectites. We've got these flows in these beds that are transforming. So turbidite, debrite, turbidite, and constantly changing. So that's showing us that um, one thing, our reservoir quality is very variable. Uh, we also see the ripple reflections and diversions uh, as flows reroute to avoid salt structures. And we see these amazing fluidization structures where our sediment is loaded in um, and flows and some of our um, like mini folds there with kind of kink banded mess transport fold. A second point is that pinch outs and onlaps are really common. Uh, so here's an example from the field. So uh, from, Bacchio, from the beach near Bacchio, we can see that this, this individual flow or this individual bed uh, loses its thickness um, up the slope over the scale of the outcrop. Um, so it's quite thick at the base where we've got these stacked high density turbidites. So in terms of reservoir quality, that would be quite good. But as we approach, we thin the unit and we also get muddier. So as we approach the pinch, pinch out, the unit's much thinner and it's also much muddier. 
So not so great for reservoir quality, but potentially quite good for stratigraphic traffic. Um, and we see very similar things in our numerical models. So we see these kind of pseudo onlap geometries as our uh, stratigraphy is approaching the crest of the diet here. Um, and we've been able to kind of extract some information, some statistics from that. So you can see that the thinning rate of, this, of the stratigraphic packages increases uh, threefold between the zone that's kind of directly influenced by the salt versus somewhere a little bit further afield. So we can see that the strata is definitely more modulated quite rapidly the closer you get to the salt structure. We're also able to see this on a completely different scale in the uh, flume tank. So because in the flume tank we built our structures out of sand, um, we and our flows contain denser, a variety of densities of grain. So we had uh, or we had garnet, which was to represent our really dense part of the flow, and we also put plastics and clay in to represent the lighter kind of organic fragments within the, within the flow. So you can see that at the base we've got this gra um, garnet wedge, which is ponded. So that's essentially the exact same thing that we have here, the ponding of that thicker, higher density deposit. And then as we get further up, we're actually seeing our sand, so our kind of medium density things here. And then we're seeing the, uh, the bypass down dip of plastics and clay and our lighter fragments. So exactly how we see in the field, we've got ponding of topography. Uh, we've also got slowing of flow velocity and fining thinning and thinning of the deposit um, above that dense layer. And then we've got potential bypass down dip. Um, so I just like to kind of make this in terms of trying to communicate what we're talking about here. Our flows are actually, they're climbing up a slope. Um, so it's me run it, running. If I run, I'll be quite happy sitting at the bottom of a hill. So that's why we've got lots of happy zoes sitting at the bottom of the hill. Versus if you're trying to get up the hill, it's gonna take a lot, of, lot more energy. You're gonna lose your energy as you're getting up the hill. And by the time you get to the top of the hill, you're gonna be a sad zoe. So sad zoe is supposed to represent poorer reservoir quality, whereas at the back at bottom of the hill there, we're likely to see our thicker sapped sap. Is that mass failure deposits are common on a variety of scales in the field and also in core. Uh, we can see a huge a variety of different mass failures. And people tend to think of mass failures or debrites and all of these different things as different um, flow processes. But for here, we're just going to concern that they're things that have fallen off of something. So they're failures of some description. As uh, so we can see something maybe more typical of a slump here, a boulder bed. These are more typical of individual mass flows. Um, here we've got a large limestone class. Uh, now, um, um, back here, this thought to have been a limestone plat a carbonate platform growing, and as that platform's grown and failed, the carbonate blocks are thought to have fallen off the sides of the diaphane and actually formed their own individual tiny topography that's been unlapped by subsequent deposits. I'd like to now talk you through the different uh, failures by going to the field area, so the different types of failures we see in the field. Um, so we're going to go back to those kind of two my, uh, basins that we were looking at. So in the, in the basin between the two structures, um, we've got limestone class that again come from the top of the diaphane. They're, they're angular, they're class supported, um, and there's quite a lot of them. They're quite large. My field assistant is somewhere in this photo, but this is the, due to the size of the class, you actually can't see him. Uh, whereas when we're on the other side of the diaphane, these class are actually um, smaller. So you can actually resolve my supervisor in this image. Um, and they're much more mud rich. So this gives us the indication that because the flows have only got one piece of topography to, um, to contend with, they're not completely confined, and they're actually able to dilute and become muddier. Um, as we look in the siliciclastic stratigraphy here, so we've not got too much information from this, this part between on the partially confined setting, but what I wanted to make the point here is on that confined structure and I know part, uh, basin, sorry, and I know I've shown this picture before, we've got a huge amount of variability on the scale of the outcrop. So between typically what we would look at and resolve as something um, quite close together, we might not even be able to see them as different reflectors in, in uh, seismic data, but we've got something that's much more typical of a slump, so beds that have been deposited and then remobilized and folded. Um, and these would indicate in terms of a reservoir point of view, deep zones, so they're actually areas of sand where the sand might be able to leak up, um, sorry, where the oil might be able to leak through the sand and escape, uh, causing leak, leak, leakage pathways, versus in this mega debrite, there are blocks of sand that have been moved from somewhere. So while those blocks of sand might be 
oil rich, they're actually within this uh, really muddy matrix, so aren't going to act as uh, liquid pathways and potentially more like a baffle. The log here, everything in brown, is uh, debrites. So those debrites and mass failures are just to show that those, uh, those mass failures uh, add extra stratigraphy. So we can see there's more stratigraphy there because they're um, locally, there's more stratigraphy because the mass failures are um, there's the failing. So there's extra stratigraphy in the basin locally, um, preventing us from being able to decipher really nice, clean progradation, retrogradation, aggradation, or stacking of our deep marine system. Okay, so number four is that our mini basins are very, very individualized. So we'll just look here at two examples on either side of the Bacchio uh, diaper. Thought to be of a stimulus stratigraphy, although I must mention the biostrat isn't amazing. Um, and we can see that we've got between the two structures quite well scoured into each other, um, lobate style geometry. So here these thick bedded sandstones. Whereas when we get to the other side of the structure, we've still got a lot of these mass transport deposits present. And if we zoom in, there's kind of this scour geometry, um, a little bit like these small scale channels that actually appear to be stepping towards the, the diapers, towards the diaper. Uh, they're finding upwards um, with quite coarse bases, but quite laminated tops, which is very different to the structure, we, the uh, sedimentology that we see in, the, in between. And we think that that's because um, at this point in time, we've got two structures and they're essentially preventing flow run out between them. So those flows that are deposited between them are scouring and smooshing and amalgamating on top of each other. Whereas the flows that are moving around them um, are able to almost meander um, and move around, avoiding the stratigraphy. So they've got more space to run out and therefore more space to um, have form these like kind of lateral accretion packages. Of the basin and further away from the diaper, Closer to the diaper, you've got more mass flow deposits and you've got more muddy, um, lower density turbidites. And adjacent, and, and on either side of the diaper, as we move around the diaper, you can't assume sim symmetry because the, the um, salt is actually, uh, sorry, the sediments are actually able to flow around. We can put those PS wells on so it's, we can show that while we think we might be drilling the same unit, we're actually drilling, it could be in a completely different depositional element, completely different halokinetic sequence. Um, I'm overlaying now the seismic data from the PS field, um, which just gives the idea of the, that you probably wouldn't be able to resolve these things on seismic at all. There's a huge amount of sub-seismic variability, um, which varies with the amount of confinement that we just can't resolve in um, the subsurface. Um, so we're almost there now. Um, second to last point to make is that halokinetic kinesis will eventually stop influencing strata if our sedimentation rate is great enough or our salt is going to um, start begins to weld. So if we look at our numerical model again, uh, we can overlay some thinning rates um, that we've got been able to extract. The thinning rates decrease as we go up uh, the numerical models. Uh, and this is showing that as we, uh, as we further bury the salt structure, the, the stratigraphy doesn't necessarily notice the influence of the salt below as much as it did. So we're less modulated by halokinesis. We can also see this in um, the upper part of the stratigraphy at Bacchio. So the very other, the upper um, unit, uh, there's lots and lots of kind of braided um, systems that appear to not really be dipping. There's a much reduction in our mass failure deposits and the structures, the um, sediment, the stratigraphy is confined between the two salt structures. Um, and this is basically the idea that there's almost like a remnant topography that the salts maybe stopped growing, but there's still a bit of topography that they're being funneled down. So it's still controlled by the salts existence, but it's, it's existence in the past. Um, and this is a log through that area to show that as we get further up stratigraphy, there's a reduction in mass failure and a reduction in bed thinning through time. And this is how we kind of know that our failures or at least the topographic expression has started to reduce. Final point. Um, is that confinement matters. Now, if you've been in lockdown for so many weeks in the UK or wherever you are, you will start to realise that confinement matters a lot. So here's an example of an unconfined deep marine system. And in those cases, uh, using the Karoo, so this laterally extensive um, unit in um, South Africa, kilometre scale, as an analogue, is great. It's perfect for your res for reservoir um, information and sub seismic veggies. But where we're looking at a confined structure, either with salt or with um, a variety 
so either with salt or with uh, riffs or with any kind of topography, we need to start using something that's a little bit more fit for purpose. I'll just quickly explain how a lobe's overall geometry can vary, whether it's confined or unconfined. So this is work from the Karoo um, by our group. Um, so unconfined lobes can be really large um, and they have these zones of uh, axis, off axis, or whatever you choose to call them, that vary in terms of reservoir quality and diagenesis, diagenesis um, et cetera. Where we've done work on confined structures with fold and thrust belts, um, the lobes are much smaller, and they're a little bit more elongated. And what we're trying to add with this work is that when the confined structures have active topography, so the salt is actually growing, there's gonna be these added failures into the basin, causing subsequent flows to have to re very last point is that our um, progradational systems in deep marine, again, all of the work on that stems from these unconfined better basins. Um, and where we have these progradational systems, they typically compensationally stack. So they avoid the depositional topography of the previous deposit. Where we've got one salt wall, so in our flume tank experiments or in our uh, one side of the diapir, we see that the flows still compensationally stack, but they seem to be able to move a little bit quicker. So they do still have the space to dilute, but only on one side because the salt's in the way on the other side. And where we have two salt structures, we see thick beds between them that are scoured, they're high density, um, giving us the idea that they've, they've, they've prograded um, and that the progradation has been enhanced by the topography. So they've actually been able to move a little bit thicker, uh, further, sorry, getting a little bit thicker because they're essentially funneled, because they're unable to run out, the flows can't run out, the flows can't decelerate, so they are stacking and moving forwards. Um, so that, thank you very much for listening. Here's a pr pretty picture of the field area, um, um, just to make everyone who's stuck in confinement really miss the field. I'm sure that many of us here wish have been um, missing our field seasons. Key points of the multidisciplinary approaches are really great to understand these things, so including modeling, in our typical subsurface workflow is really important. And that our mini, mini basins can be highly, highly individualized because they're controlled by salt processes, by sedimentation processes, and also by regional tectonics. And therefore we should really be looking at the best fit for purpose analogs. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Thank you very much for listening. And if anyone has got any questions, I can take them now, or if there's more, because I think I've seen some popping up, then I'll respond later <laughs> thank you thank you zoe so much for that um on behalf of the aapg we really appreciate you giving the first talk um as uh founder of this group and also co-chair of aapg women's network we sincerely thank you for your time and your knowledge and your expertise and thank you to all of you have who have been able to attend we really appreciate uh that you're here and your support so now I will open it up for questions. So what I'm going to do is I'll read uh, the questions in the chat. And then if you have any additional questions, please put them in the chat or uh, raise your hand and I'll allow you to uh, speak. Um, okay, so going to the chat. So the first question is from Mark Rowan. He says, or ask, is asking you, Zoe, in your numerical model, you had 600 meters of roof above your initial dive pier. But in his experience, that is approximately double the max roof thickness that um, we see on passive dive piers without shortening. Can you please comment and speculate what differences there would be if you had a thinner roof? Yeah, um, okay, great, great point, Mark. Um, so the numerical models, um, we have, um, where we've had a thinner roof, we actually um, see that, yeah, the salt structure grows much, much, much quicker. Um, so we're just trying to keep the growth similar to the North Sea so that it makes it comparable. Um, there's obviously a huge amount of things you can do with the numerical models. So it's also controlled by the strength of the roof itself. Um, and the density that you give to those units as well as the thickness. So with the numerical models, you can vary all of these different parameters. Um, we do give the diaper kind of a little kick so that it actually starts growing off it on itself, um, which is possibly why it will rise quicker than what we experience in nature in terms of those um, 
that overall um, stratigraphy there. It is also speculated, the same as kind of it was in Leonardo's models, that there is um, already these uh, pre, uh, pre-kinematic units that are in place. So some of the salt might actually have been moving during those pre-kinematic uh, units, so there might not have been quite as much stratigraphy. Uh, but we wanted to try and keep the salt down um, so that because of the numerical model, sometimes if we push it too far, uh, too fast, because obviously we're using quite a small amount of time, we don't want to um, create something unrealistic in terms of like the salt uh, exploding. Thank you for that, Zoe. We have another question here from Hein van Gen from Shell. Yeah. Uh, he said, fantastic talk, Zoe, many thank you. Uh, he thinks perhaps you had mentioned it, but what is the limestone along the Guernica diapir? Is that a resi residual diapir? Could that, I'm just throwing in there, could that be cap rock? Or? Uh, yeah, I think, so that's, um, it's, it's older, so it's, more, it's, a Jurassic, it's, the, it's a Jurassic limestone there. Um, and the salt, the salt itself um, is, is sort of more of like a salt, kind, a salt called anticline in its structure. Um, so it's Jurassic to Beremian. So potentially, yeah, it could be cap rock. Uh, it could be related to the same structure that we, the carbonate platforms that we think are on top of the Bacchio uh, diaper during deposition. Um, but it could also be uh, slightly older. Okay, thank you for that. From Oscar Fernandez. Um, hi, Zoe, great talk. I have a question on the frequency of mass flow deposits relative to the onlap angles of your syn kinematic strata. Do higher onlap angles correspond to greater frequency of mass flow deposits? Absolutely, yeah. So absolutely, if the flows are, yeah, if, yeah, if you've got a higher on onlap angle, you're basically creating more instability. So more likely to fail and fall off of the side. Uh, so in, there's also a difference, not only in the free frequency, but also in the style of mass flow. So if you have got a very high angle, it is almost more likely to just fall in place. Carlos, uh, apologies for potentially butchering your last name. Um, go <laughs> Geraldo, sorry. Um, have you completed any restoration exercises as a part of your PhD? And I'm sure he's not suggesting that you actually do it if it's not within the scope, but just have you done any? <laughs> uh, no, no, we haven't done any. I'm aware of some that have been done that involve uh, much more advanced uh, data than what we have available. So uh, and they should be hitting uh, the shelves as such relatively soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, from Dr. Saeed Haroon Ali, he is a researcher with Petronas um, in uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. he, he says, hey Zoe, thanks for the very nice presentation. Is there any relationship between erosion and salt rise in the subsurface? Uh, in, in our area, in, in, uh, so I can only, only speak for the North Sea there. Um, we see, so in terms of erosion from the mass failure deposits, I guess, or um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, if, if so the mass failure deposits, um, they can, they don't really erode enough to um, cause further failure. So it, it is derived, I guess the up dip failure um, from the shelf that, that causes the 40s fan, that failure does then drive, um, diaper rise because that failure and that erosion from the up dip is providing all of the sediment that then down dip adjacent to the diapers does form uh does cause these salt structures to rise yeah and i think i think what he's also means is like um if something is ha if a diaper has been eroded that does that allow it to rise through the subsurface easier and i would say yes yes, yes. sorry yeah. if i yeah no it's okay i think that's <laughs> I think that's what, yeah. what that was. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Because you've removed um, the roof, so you've basically removed the pressure that's on top of it, so it's able to yep. become yep. a mushroom geometry. Um, let's see here. Yes, Hein, um, this session is being recorded and we will be sharing this, ses this session. I have to uh, just go through and uh, do a little bit of editing and we'll post it on our YouTube channel and we'll email uh, everyone to let them know that it's been posted. So yeah, we are creating a YouTube channel with this work. Um, 
Okay, so Nazar Ahmad says, ideally high resolution seismic data is required to delineate the termination and limits of sediments and salt. Could you please explain the requirement of that high resolution seismic data? Um, so it's definitely required because you're actually able to follow. So this, around the diaper, there's this zone of basically blur um, where you can't really tell whether that's the broader part of the salt structure, potentially a salt overhang that's causing that, or whether that is actually the strat stratigraphy. So in terms of trying to configure where your uh, salt ends and where your stra when your strata pinches out, um, and therefore how far your sand um, gets towards the diapit, you do need to be able to see that, see that and resolve that. So um, that's basically, you can see that in higher resolution data, you can get further towards the onlap and you can start to uh, have a better understanding of the kind of edge of the salt. From Jillian uh, Apps over in the UK, great talk Zoe. I really like the idea about enhanced progradation through lateral confinement. Do you have any constraint on the third dimension of topography? I imagine if the confinement is extensive to salt walls, then progradation may be particularly fast with maybe little, little aggradation. Conversely, loading may enhance aggradation. Yes, I mean, so we have only ran those experiments that we ran with that where the salt, well, where the topography was kind of the similar geometry. Uh, we, it definitely would be different with salt, um, depending on the geometry, so whether you use something more typically of a, of a diaper um, or whether it was a kind of salt wall. And that's something we're trying to look at now with the numerical models is like how much confinement uh, is, is required and how much confinement do you see between these uh, structures uh, and how does that control our kind of aggradation. Um, definitely, yeah, if you've got um, more loading, you're more likely to see aggradation because you'll just deposit one load and then deposit another one and deposit another one on top of each other. Um, so yeah, with it's, it, it requires the angle between the flow, de the depositional flow process and the, sorry, the flow, the, the flow direction and the, um, salt, uh, the salt structure to be kind of parallel to each other for this kind of um, enhancement and uh, to occur. We did also see it in our oblique topography experiments, but not in the frontal confinement. I've just seen Mark's comment as well. Um, so the carbonate is not caprock, which, yes. So the carbonate in the towards Guernica is not caprock. It is actually, I, yeah, it's, it's younger. So it's Jurassic to, uh, to Beremian in age, I believe. So it's not caprock. It is more to do with a carbonate platform that was across the area at the time. Apologies if I waffled to make that sound not quite right. Uh, Zoe, would you like to um, continue with more questions or should I ha email you those questions? Um, I can carry on, yeah, carry on for a little bit. A little bit? Okay, you tell us. Yeah, I don't know, is, is okay. everyone like going? <laughs> it's okay, yeah, no. Um, I will respond if you email, if you email me, then I can respond to everybody anyways. Okay. So um, Daniel Lopez, he said, great uh, presentation. Um, in your experience, how is the strain around salt wall in the outcrops? So um, here we may need him to be a little bit more specific. I mean, I guess I can talk about in terms of the, the stratigraphy. Like, so uh, my experience would be that uh, it's definitely much more deformed in terms of fracturing. So fracturing and faulting adjacent to the salt structures in, in the beds that are particularly overturned, they have been um, deformed. They've got a lot of um, fault fractures, veins running through them adjacent to the structure. Um, so if that's kind of what we, and they, they do, they, there are less of those as you get further away from the diaper. So I would say the salt, uh, the strain is, uh, accommodated closer to the diaper. Um, we don't, I can't, we don't have like the top of part of the diaper, so unfortunately not really able to say whether there's more strain over the top. Uh, in our numerical models over the crest of the diaper, that is where you're seeing the majority of the strain and the majority of the fault in. So um, that's what we see in the field. In, in the field, yeah, it's on the flanks of the diaper. <laughs> Hold on. 
Okay, um, from Karina Vasquez, uh, nice work. Can you please highlight the ratio of the sediment input between confined and unconfined setting? Um, is I, I is that from the sorry? Is that from the flame tank stuff? I think that might be the flame tank um, information uh, flame tank experiments. So um, the sediments for for the flame tank experiments, it was exactly the same sediment input. Okay, thank you for that. Stan Stanbrook, great talk, Zoe. Thank you. Reservoir quality uh, degradation from axis towards pinch out is a well-established concept, especially in less confined systems. However, highly confined systems, such as the Anot reservoir quality might be maintained right to the point of onlap. I wonder if any of your experimental work reflects this. Um, yep, so um, Anot's an amazing area that I've uh, been to. Um, and yeah, you definitely see a huge amount of different flow processes operating in the onlaps. Um, and some of them do maintain their sand thickness, but also kind of become more kind of transformational uh, flow deposits. So the reservoir quality isn't quite as good, if you like, adjacent to the salt, the, uh, not salt, it's cold and thrust salts there, sorry. Um, we do kind of see this, the, that in our um, flume tank experiments, the sand does kind of just stop. Um, and then we see the, the fines bypassing. Uh, which I think is similar to what uh, my colleague Ewan's observed in ANOP. Also in our numerical models, um, while we, we do still see that the salt, is, the, st the stratigraphy is still in some places quite, uh, it's not that thinned against it, where it, it crops onto the, the salt. Um, so although our res yeah, reservoir quality is one of the inputs, it does depend on the flows um, and how quickly they're moving. Um, and uh, how, therefore how quickly the sed sedimentation rate, because obviously if you are just chucking a load of sand down, it is go it's not gonna have time to run out towards the topography if there is so much sand. I hope that was the right answer, like helpful, not the right topic. <laughs> it was great, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. This is from um, Nazif Umar. Thank you, Zoe, for such an amazing presentation. I understand that your work is on salt tectonics. However, I would like to know if I could perhaps employ your approach on shale influenced uh, settings. So instead of um, salt diapiers, shale diapiers. Yep. Um, I mean, the general idea for the work, um, especially the, the, new, the physical models, is that it's just topography. So it could be topography caused by shale diapiers. Obviously, in the field, what we see and the subsurface is what we see is caused by um, salt, but there's no reason why if something, so shale's buoyant, it's moving upwards, it will deform beds around um, to have similar failures, mass failures, um, and also uh, systems rerouting around shale diapiers has uh, definitely been documented. And uh, in the numerical models, while we've got the structure at the moment to represent salt, there would, wouldn't be any uh, issue with uh, making this, the salt have the properties of shale and therefore um, adapting it in that way. So yeah, it's definitely um, comparable and usable across different types of topography, not just salt. Great. Are you still good to keep answering questions? I've seen 27 new messages. Yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> we can, yeah, we can, we can do no we can no take pressure. a few more. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, 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 take a okay. few more and then if you can send me all of them, I'll make sure I reply to people. Okay, okay. If you've already asked a question, I'm just going to skip over you and move on to someone who hasn't asked a, a question yet, just to be uh, a little bit more fair. Um, Miriam Berchotti, thanks Zoe. Is there evidence for the failure deposits being sourced locally from the diapiers rather than from the shelf? That's a great question. That's a question that I love. Um, so yes, um, we can see, we did a whole load of crashes, qual um, quantifications and de deciphering where we had, whether we had slumps or mass failure, mass, uh, mega debris and different things. And you could, um, you do see which ones have come from further afield and then which ones have come from the sides of the diapir. Um, there's around, roughly it's about a kilometer either side of the diapir that you can see these failures that are diaperically derived and outside of that, they're likely to have been derived from the shelf. The shelf. Um, we do know that the shelf was failing and there's this huge uplift. Um, 
And the ways we can tell that, I guess, is that you can actually see in some of these folds the axial traces that have been, when the fin beds have been deposited on the flanks of the dive here, they've actually then been kind of pushed up and remobilized and have slumped backwards. So there's definitely, um, that's one of the key uh, players. Also where we see lots of limestone, we know that there was limestone on top of the dive here. So if there's an mass failure deposit with limestone in it, we know that that's highly likely to have sourced from the dive here. Um, Billy Andrews. Hey Zoe, lovely talk and gorgeous outcrops. Um, <laughs> it's not fair that we're all stuck in quarantine and tease us. I was wondering if you almost, uh, if you see almost sweet spots between faults and fracture dominated reservoir and good reservoir quality sands. With thinning, I would also expect uh, fracture saturation to increase the areas of activation. Um, hi Billy. Um, yes. Um, what I've just kind of talked about with this strain, um, you see a lot more fractures towards the thinner sand. So I think that is controlled by the fact that we've got mudstones, thinly bedded sandstones, etc. there um, that are increasing the amount of fracturations that we see, as well as the fact that the salt is trying to push its way out. Um, and yeah, there are zones where, in terms of our broad zones of deformation, that kind of window of strain around the diaper is where we would expect to see the majority of faults and fractures. And then as we get further afield, further away from the uh, structures, the faults are more kind of sin sedimentary, so they're more related to slumping and um, failures there, and that rotation of individual blocks. Great. Uh, this one is from Kate Giles. Great work, Zoe. Are the erosional halokinetic sequence boundaries only created by mass wasting failure, or is there another sedimentologic erosional mechanism in these deep water deposits that you've documented? That's a really good question, um, Kate. So yes, the mass failure deposits, you, you, so you can form these erosional surfaces from the mass failure deposits, but we also believe you can form them at channel basis, so where you've had um, a channel, channelized system um, that's erosional, so you've got a conduit of moving, so some kind of slope channel um, or even a low, low bit channel, they can be erosional enough to cut into the surfaces um, and form kind of localized ones. So we're not, we're sometimes difficult to decipher whether we're looking at um, a halokinetic secret, uh, unconformity or whether we're looking at um, a channel that it's actually cut down. Um, but in terms of base level, I think that they it definitely could be one of the options. Um, also, anywhere where we're seeing a huge amount of erosional scouring, so some of these lobes that chomp into each other, um, could potentially give uh, these erosional surfaces, whether they're related to, uh, specifically related to the um, halokinetic boundaries, or whether they're kind of an internal unconformity within the halokinetic sequence is something yet to be discovered or mm -hmm. thought about a little bit more, but definitely food for thought. Simon Jackson. Hi Zoe, thanks for the great presentation. In your numerical models, what controls do you have on rate of diapir rise? What sort of feedback mechanisms do the models take into account? Do you account for, or do you see in other data, other structures, for example, turtles, um, grounding, mini basins, what impacts do these have? That was a lot, sorry. That's a lot of questions, right, okay. So, <laughs> so my, the first one is, um, what controls do you have on the rate of diapir rise? For okay, for our numerical models, so we um, input a, numer a diapir rise rate into them, so they're actually given a upwards movement that's based on the upward movement of the uh, North Sea diapirs, North and South Pierce. We also give it, it's also very, very weak. So all of our other layers are mechanically strong, whereas salt is given, you can, with a discrete element model, you can give each individual element a property. So all of those discrete elements are given, uh, are essentially very, very weak, so that they're able to flow, uh, move ductilely rather than brittly. Uh, so this is why the salt will kind of grow buoyantly. Uh, that combined with the sediment having its own um, strength and its own internal density further drives the kind of passive diaphorism. Uh, what else was there? Feedback mechanisms? I think that's, do you account for, or do you see another data, other structures? Yes, so um, when we allow the salt to continue to grow, we do start to see it welding um, and touching down. Um, if that's, and then also, yeah, it, we can see uh, if we were to stop, that when we've done experiments where we've 
stopped the um, sedimentation or stopped the salt growth, that's when you do start to see these turtles uh, developing. So they do seem to replicate reality pretty well. Um, there's a lot of examples where they, they're quite similar. Um, and obviously with it being a, um, a model, you can vary so many different parameters. So we try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, but it's obviously still controlled by a lot of things. So there's still gravity in it. We've still got like sediment uh, increases with compaction um, and layer strength increases with compaction, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, thank you. Eric Scott, for the Spanish outcrops, how much influence do the sediment input styles, so point source or line source, and the, the location affect the depositional style next to the diapirs? Um, so I think hugely is the, is the answer, um, because it essentially controls whether you're seeing something deposited at spill to spill, where you've got flow perpendicular, so uh, source area perpendicular to salt structure orientation or parallel or oblique. So in, in the Spanish outcrops, it's kind of parallel to oblique, where um, the structures are running uh, pre so pretty much with the uh, parallel to the input orientation. And I think that's what further enhances the progradation and kind of keeps them confined for longer, um, enabling and prevent, well, preventing flow run out, but pushing forward uh, progradation. Uh, if it were, if you're at a different orientation, you're then very likely to get these kind of fill to spill basins or think, uh, flows moving around them if they're not coming at the same angle. So definitely that's something that I think is slightly overlooked. Like there's the idea everyone's really, um, I think fill to spill is quite well understood, but not all salt. Um, is perpendicular to flow direction. So that is definitely a really big control on how and where your sands are going to be pondered, whether they'll be pondered up dip or down dip from your diaper. And also the geometry of the salt structure is really uh, important there. Suman Das, excellent presentation, Zoe. Is there a way to differentiate between the pseudo onlap by pre salt sediments and the actual onlap pinch out by halokinetic sediments? Especially when the relic sediment on top of the salt cannot be uh, resolved? Oh, okay. Also, also a very, very good question. Um, I think with, I mean, if you can see actual on that, with actual on that, you would expect to see some kind of fasces change. So you'd expect to see things going um, over a broader kind of depositional scale. You'd expect to see things going from being a bit, if it's a sand, being a bit sandier to getting muddier and muddier as you approach the onlap. Whereas with your pre kinematic kind of pseudo onlap, where um, you're pa essentially passively folding over the tip of the diaper, uh, you wouldn't um, expect to see so many fascist variabilities and changes. So I think where we've got, where you can actually trace that and see that there are changes internally in the package. So not just thickness, but also in your actual whether you're looking, how your flow or your bed is deforming is. Probably the best way to look at that, but that is a good question. It's quite difficult. We've found, you know, it is difficult to decipher in the numerical models whether that is an onlap or whether that's a bed that was deposited all the way across and has then fallen um, off and sort of remobilized. Great. We're almost done. We have one, okay. one, one more, and then one kind of funny question for to end this. So oh no, funny question. It's not Mark, is it? No. <laughs> it's an anonymous attendee. So this is the the last serious question. Okay, the last serious question. <laughs> Does the, the composition of the salt from the different systems, um, for, like for example, uh, comparing North Spain versus North Sea, um, so is the salt compositionally different, the salt itself? Yes. And can you speak to whether um, these would create different relief that would change the facies? That's a good question. Uh, yes, so in the North Sea, we're looking at the Zechstein, which is primarily at that point, um, halite and in, in, around Pierce. Whereas in Spain, it's definitely a less pure, a more, more impure um, salt with um, more kind of banded um, layers and hydrates and bits of gypsum, et cetera. My understanding of this um, is that that would mean that the salt is actually more buoyant, so able to grow more because it's halite. Um, so it's, it's able to rise because it's completely low density. Whereas when it's got these other layers in it, um, it's potentially not going to rise as much. So I therefore think that we get more uh, kind of a steeper slope, if that makes any sense, like steeper slopes around the structures where we've got pure halite, whereas when we've got uh, more of an impure structure, we're more likely to get maybe a broader geometry and less um, uplift, less, less um, 
height on the topography uh, and that would then influence the, the uh, depositional fasces in terms of our stratigraphy that's deposited because as we uh, depending on the slope angle is going to depend on how quickly our flows could deform so if you've got a relatively shallow slope angle you might actually be seeing sands getting all the way over the top of the crest whereas if you've got a particularly high slope angle you're actually going to see just the majority of your deposit ponder at the base and not all of it able to run up excellent um and then our last uh i love this question uh david gamboa so will the hotel at any point fall due to halokinesis? <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that, that's actually, I've actually been asked that when I've been over there. So we were actually leading a sponsor's trip and we were all like clumbering over the rocks and they were saying like, we live just up there. Would that be a problem? Um, I think it's all good for now. If there was another uh, equivalent to the Pyrenean orogeny that saw a bit of our a reactivation of the structure, then yeah, you might be in trouble. But I think, I think on like a hotel's lifestyle, um, it has uh, some bigger problems. <laughs> all right, but that's, that's a great all Thank you. Um, a lot of people are saying thank you, great job. Um, I have the chat saved, so I will email it to you, Zoe. And again, if anyone else thinks of anything to talk about, please feel free to reach out to us at aapgsaltbasins at gmail.com. We can forward your note on to Zoe if you don't have um, her contact information. Additionally, once we post this YouTube video on our social media outlets, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, feel free to comment uh, in the comment sections on those posts if you would like to continue any discussions related uh, to this talk. So we highly encourage you to continue to gauge with us online as we continue to grow uh, the SALT community. So thank you so much. Um, Tim, Clara, um, do you guys have anything else left that you would like to add before we end this meeting? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure if you mentioned whether or not uh, Oliver Duffy will be presenting next. Thank you for that. Yes. So in two weeks, so the way that this, uh, we've set up this seminar series is every two weeks we'll be having a talk until the beginning of December. And next week, uh, Oliver Duffy from the Applied Geodynamics Laboratory, the BEG at UT Austin, he will be presenting in two weeks, same time. So we're really looking forward uh, to his presentation. So please feel free to, uh, it, we will be posting the registration link on our social media after this talk. So please feel free to register again and to forward this information on to other uh, SALT colleagues uh, within your companies or to your students. This is uh, free and open to all. You don't necessarily have to be an APG member, although membership is always encouraged as a thank you for um, you know, the, the webinar and to the speaker. So anything else? from our panelists. Just thank you, merci, and uh, bonsoir, have a good day and good evening, or uh, take care everyone. And if you're in uh, Singapore or that area. Yeah, thank you for staying up late for those of you in the Eastern Hemisphere, and huge thank you to Zoe. You did a, an amazing job. It's really inspiring uh, for me to see what you've done. It's an integrated study. I, I absolutely love that, using um, all these different methods as tools to answer your field work question. So it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you for organizing and thank you to everyone for their comments. And I'll make sure that I do respond to any questions that I haven't answered properly. So thank you everybody. And thanks guys for organizing and inviting me. It was brilliant. Clara, anything from you? Okay. She's on okay. mute. <laughs> you. Okay. She's in two meetings. Okay, good. All right, <laughs> I'm going to uh, close this this meeting. Thank you Perfect. all. Thanks, Rochelle. Bye. -bye.